A short while ago, Michelle Sen went to Brian Johnson's Don't Die Summit, camera in hand, and did an awesome job of figuring out what it was all about. The comment section came alive with various points of view about Brian's protocol and Michelle's coverage of the event. Most people said something like Physionic did. Michelle did a wonderful job. But some people like Blair Robertson said, Unfortunately, this seemed more like a Brian Johnson infomercial. I was expecting skepticism and scrutiny. And I thought, Michelle is so nice and so positive, and I'm such a grumpy old man. Hey, kid, get off my lawn. Grandpa, you don't even have a lawn. Michelle responded graciously to those comments, but said if she had to do it again, she would push back on more claims. So I put on my black hat, but know that Michelle and I worked on the short episode together, and she agrees. First, I winced at all the packaged processed food. Is it just me, or is the packaged blueprint nutty pudding an ultra-processed food? It has isolates, emulsifiers, alternative sweeteners, and a contribution from the multi-billion dollar flavoring industry, which has helped transform foods like Doritos from a not-so-popular corn chip to a sensation we can't stop eating. Hey, Dad, can we have some Doritos? Sorry, guys. I don't think I can reach that far. Please? I guess I'll have to eat them all myself. Oh, man, I'm getting pulled over. Mom, Dad's going to be a little late. The nutty pudding recipe on his website looks a whole lot less ultra-processed. I know, there are a lot of positive videos on YouTube about the emulsifier sunflower seed lecithin. But for a skeptical view of emulsifiers in general, I recommend Federica Amati's video. She is speaking at our TEDx conference, by the way. My second thought was, I don't know about all these supplements. Deborah Cato, a gerontologist from Stanford who actually conducts studies on supplements, had this to say in response to an audience question. So I'm a geriatrician by training, and uh, my patients sometimes ask me, well, doctor, what, what supplements can I take to perhaps help my brain or my bones or my cart uh, or my joints? What supplements should I take? And I will say that in most ca cases, my answer is very simple. None. I've been uh, fortunate enough to be in this field for over 30 years now, so I've kind of seen um, the vicissitudes of people who come in and they really believe that they've, they, found, they found the thing. They found what you need, and they've shown that if you give whatever this treatment to, say, worms, mice, even primates, this can extend lifespan. And um, this has resulted um, with the government now not regulating supplements, that there are a lot of those things online that you can go out and purchase, spending easily $60 a month. And um, to their credit, these scientists often do what they believe in, right? But I will say that of all those things that I've watched over the years, none of those scientists are known for their extreme longevity. I'm just saying. <laughs> Okay, uh, and unfortunately, some of them, most of them have passed before the age of 80, which isn't even considered very old right now. My third thought was, do we have evidence that olive oil is all that it's cracked up to be? We do have that evidence for veggies, fruit, and beans. For example, Bruce Ames published a paper in Nature that compiled a lot of studies showing that people in the lower quartile of fruit and veggie consumption have double the risk of cancer of people in the top quartile. Do we have evidence that is that powerful for olive oil? Fourth, one of the most important advances of the last decade is the discovery that fermented foods and fiber are essential in creating a healthy microbiome and the profound effect healthy gut microbes have on our health. Olive oil has no fiber, and since it has no protein either, we compensate by resorting to protein powders, which have little fiber to hit our protein targets. Just check out the first ingredient in nutty pudding. We have an epidemic of gut problems, many of them coming from overuse of antibiotics and growing up on low-fiber junk food. So many people have bad reactions to fiber as a result, often because fiber-munching microbes have been depleted. So they resort to no-fiber diets, further starving their fiber-eating microbes, 
and then pass their depleted microbiome to their children so those children inherit gut problems too. It is a challenge to regrow a depleted microbiome and there's rarely an instant fix. So people conclude a no-fiber diet is healthier because they feel better in the first few days they try it. That's like getting out of shape and going to the gym and finding out you feel terrible in the weeks and months that follow. Ugh. You feel a whole lot better taking afternoon naps instead. Maybe you even strain stuff at the gym by being impatient. It takes patience to get in shape. Will Bolsowitz has many great episodes about gut issues on Zoe that I recommend. Fifth, I think the numbers are in that a small percentage of Americans are willing to go to the gym and work out for an hour. But we are seeing encouraging data coming out that some activities like tennis may be even more associated with longevity than resistance and balance training. Maybe because they're fun, social, and involve coordination, not just strength and balance. I don't know. To Brian's credit, he did tweet out one of these studies, but I haven't seen him talk about them much. Sixth, I don't know who all of his 30 doctors are, but I am having trouble getting comfortable with Oliver Zolman, who plays a major part. All these regenerative therapies or disease-modifying therapies that can actually cure diseases rather than, uh, you know, just treat the symptoms, uh, they're always like, you know, five years away or 10 years away, always stuck in clinical research or in the literature and never making it into, into, into patients. So yeah, my interest has always been bringing those innovations uh, faster um, and into, into the real world, out of research. My background is science, so I struggle with the idea that the science is taking too long. So let's just get this stuff out there and see what happens. And I'm not sure what longevity experts Brian is referring to that can't agree with each other. If the anti-aging scientists can't agree among themselves, what does the average person like myself do? So the first step is to acknowledge we don't know. But I do know a lot of longevity scientists who agree on major pillars of longevity. For example, Robert Waldinger runs Harvard's famous 80-year study on longevity, has a highly regarded book and an equally regarded TEDx talk. What if we could study people from the time that they were teenagers all the way into old age to see what really keeps people happy and healthy? We did that. But over and over, over these 75 years, our study has shown that the people who fared the best were the people who leaned into relationships with family, with friends, with community. So kudos to Brian for his great relationship with his dad and his son. To his credit again, he does list relationships as one of his top power laws in longevity. Stanford's famous 80-year study determined conscientiousness was the number one character trait that helped people live long. So kudos to Brian for being so conscientious. Adventists know something about longevity and have this to say. I mentioned this morning about some of our longest living Adventists who participated in this study. And Lydia, just such a sense of enthusiasm and passion for life uh, at 110 years of age. She was getting around on her own. She would go out and eat at restaurants a couple of times a week. And she had this marvellous sense of humour. And that's one of the things I've discovered, the positive optimism and sense of humour that does make a difference with our quality of life. In all of the centenarians that I've interviewed, they all have that quality. So kudos to Brian for his great sense of humour. We are going to read mean tweets. Okay, how to be men... <laughs> Okay, this is good. Yeah, probably my favorite one. Good job. Back to Dr. Cato on what she thinks. What tip would you have, do you have, for your children on what to do now to live a nice, long, healthy life? Yeah, so in geriatrics we say everything is multifactorial, but you said tip. So um, I'm going to just say one, and I think it applies. Uh, I think for what, regardless of what age you are, um, to really think about purpose. That, that if you have purpose, then that is a, a great guiding force to everything else. So kudos to Brian on his sense of purpose. I just interviewed Ginger Hislop, who got her master's degree from Stanford at 105 and made national headlines. Her son-in-law said her secret is that she never stops learning. You read a lot. Well, I read most everything from 
the backs of flyers to good fiction and sometimes mm -hmm. not such good fiction. <laughs> Lots of magazines. Yeah, what magazines? Daily paper. What magazines and papers? Well, I read Time cover to cover, mm -hmm. National Geographic, Smithsonian. Those are the ones I particularly enjoy. So kudos to Brian's son, Talmadge, who pointed out how obsessed the Johnsons are with reading. My own point of view is longevity is a bingo card. So in geriatrics, we say everything is multifactorial. And when I interviewed Ginger, she checked all the boxes on my big bingo card. Brian's got a big hairy goal to get a billion people on his protocol, and I love the sentiment because he believes in it so strongly. But it strikes me as a former venture-backed tech entrepreneur who lives between Google and Apple as the thinking of a rich tech guy. I'm more inclined to listen to actual longevity scientists who have more practical, lower-cost protocols that have stood the test of time. And that's who we invited to the TEDx Longevity Summit we're organizing. You'll see a lot of videos with those speakers on this channel. So I do think what Brian is doing is fascinating, but it is a case study of one person confounded by many factors like 100 different supplements.